This video is sponsored by Brilliant. I was thinking today about ways to generalize the power rule from calculus, and I thought, well, what if we tried to take the derivative of x to the a power where a was a matrix? And well, just to keep it simple, x is a real variable. And so I thought I'd make a video about it. And so one of the main tools here will be the matrix exponential formula. So let's recall that. And so that says e to the m, where m is a matrix, is the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of one over n factorial times the nth power of m. But the fact that we're taking the nth power of a matrix here means that we have to have a square matrix to start off with. And you know, that's what we'll have. And in fact, we'll explore this with three examples and they'll all be two by two matrices. The first one is a diagonal matrix. So let's take D to be lambda one, zero, zero, lambda two. So that nice diagonal matrix. And we'll start by trying to get a handle on what X to the D is. Well, using logarithm rules, we can write this as E to the natural log of X times D. But then expanding that out using our matrix exponential formula, that will be the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of one over n factorial, and then the natural log of x times d raised to the n power. But let's look in at what the natural log of x times d is. Well, that's just a scalar multiple of our matrix d. And in fact, it looks something like this. The natural log of x times lambda one, zero, zero, and then the natural log of x times lambda two. But using logarithm rules, that's simply x to the lambda one, zero, zero, x to the lambda two. I think that's pretty clear. But now we can use logarithm rules to simplify this to the natural log of x to the lambda one, zero, zero, natural log of x to the lambda two. Okay, good. And now we'll plug that into our formula that we have, you know, started to build up here. And we'll also use the fact that taking the nth power of a diagonal matrix is really easy. You just take the nth power of the diagonal entries. So that's going to leave us with the sum. We have n going from zero to infinity, just as we had before. And then we'll have this matrix, which is the natural log of x to the lambda one, all raised to the n power and then the natural log of x to the lambda two, all raised to the n power. But now, since the sum of matrices is done component-wise, we can bring that sum inside, and that's gonna give us, well, up here, we'll have the sum as in goes from zero to infinity of the natural log of x to the lambda one, all raised to the n power over n factorial, and then something really similar here. It's just going to have a lambda 2 in it. So natural log of x to the lambda 2 all raised to the n over n factorial. But now we can notice that those are just the Taylor expansion of our exponential function e. So in fact, this first one will be e to the natural log of x to the lambda 1. Or in other words, it'll be x to the lambda 1. And likewise, the second one will be e to the natural log of x to the lambda two. In other words, it will be x to the lambda two. So let's write that down. So this is gonna be x to the lambda one, zero, zero, x to the lambda two. Okay, nice. Okay, so now we've got an expression for x to the d. Let's find its derivative. If you're looking for a free and easy way to learn more about calculus and linear algebra, check out today's sponsor, brilliant.org. While watching my videos is a great place to start, you get more out of learning by doing. And that's why I highly recommend you sharpen your skills with Brilliant. Keep your love for learning alive with Brilliant's interactive lessons, perfect for those ages 10 through 110. Let me show you what sets Brilliant apart. Their interactive courses are designed to make learning fun and engaging. From math to science to data analysis and computer science, Brilliant offers a wide range of topics that'll have you saying, I never knew learning could be this exciting. What really makes Brilliant shine is its problem-solving approach. 
You won't just passively absorb information, you'll actively learn through hands-on interactive lessons that challenge your thinking and creativity. Brilliant is available on your phone, tablet, or computer, and Brilliant will support you every step of the way. No matter what skill level you're at, Brilliant can help you improve. Not sure where to start? How about with the topic of this video? They have introductory courses in calculus and linear algebra. And if you don't need that, they have a variety of STEM topics, physics, computer science, abstract algebra, and more. But we're scientists here, so don't take my word for it. You should test it for yourself. Treat yourself to a unique hands-on experience by going to brilliant.org slash Michael Penn for a 30-day free trial, and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. So we just determined that if we had a diagonal matrix, then x to that diagonal matrix power was, well, it was pretty simple. It was x to the entries on the diagonal. Okay, well, now you can probably guess what the derivative is going to look like, but let's check it a little bit more carefully with the um, definition of the derivative. Okay, so that's going to give us something like this. We'll have the limit as h goes to 0, and then I'll put my 1 over h out front, and then we'll have, let's see, x plus h raised to the d power minus x raised to the d power. So again, that's by the limit definition of the derivative. But then that's going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h. So x plus h to the d power, well, that's simply going to be x plus h all to the lambda 1 here, 0, 0, x plus h all to the lambda 2, using what we had over here. And then let's see. x to the d power we already calculated, so let's just copy that down. But now since these limits are going to be done component-wise inside of the matrix, we can bring the limit inside. And we'll have in this upper left entry, the limit as h goes to 0 of x plus h to the lambda 1 minus x to the lambda 1 over h, 0, 0. And then something really similar here, limit as h goes to 0, x plus h to the lambda 2 minus x to the lambda 2 all over h. But notice this upper entry is simply the regular derivative of x to the lambda 1. This lower right entry is simply the derivative of x to the lambda 2. But that's going to leave us with lambda 1 times x to the lambda 1 minus 1, 0, 0, lambda 2 times x to the lambda 2 minus 1. You know, using the fact that we know what the derivative is, using the power rule on the components. Okay, but that matrix actually kind of obviously factors. And in fact, after a bit of matrix arithmetic, you'll see that you get D times X to the D minus the identity matrix, which is a nice formula. It looks like the normal power rule for derivatives. It's just, we don't subtract one, we subtract the identity matrix. Okay, so let's see. We've got the derivative with respect to x of x to the d is d times x to the d minus identity matrix. But that's for this very special case when we have d as diagonal. Let's maybe look at the case when we have a matrix that's not diagonal, but it is diagonalizable. Now for the case when x is maybe not diagonal, but it is diagonalizable. And we can actually do this kind of all at once. Let's say that a is p times this diagonal matrix times p inverse, where those are the matrices that change the basis into a diagonal basis. Or P times D times P inverse, where we understand D to be this diagonal matrix. Okay, so let's start with this X to the A power. We can again write that as E to the natural log of X times A. And then we can expand that as the sum as N goes from zero to infinity of, let's see, 1 over n factorial, we'll have the natural log of x times a all raised to the n power. But now we can maybe replace a with this p d p inverse. So that's going to leave us with the sum n goes from 0 up to infinity of the natural log of x to the n over n factorial. I'm going to factor that out, which is doable because that's a scalar. And then we'll have after that p times d times p inverse raised to the n power. So now let's maybe make a little bit of an observation down here. 
and we'll look at the first few cases of n. So notice that p d p inverse squared, well that'll be p d p inverse times p d p inverse. But check it out, we have these p p inverse pairs canceling, leaving us with p d squared p inverse. And that vault follows very, very similarly to have p d p inverse to the n power as p d to the n p inverse. Okay, nice. But then since those p's and p inverses don't depend on n, we can factor them out of the sum. And that leaves us with a p here, then the sum n goes from zero to infinity of the natural log of x times d, all raised to the n over n factorial, and then a p inverse outside of the sum on the right. But by our example with the diagonal matrix, we know exactly ha what happens with that sum. So that's gonna leave us with p, and then we'll have x to the d times p inverse. But from here, well, we can take the derivative. And what will we get? So that tells us that the derivative with respect to x of x to the a, well, it'll be p times the derivative with respect to x of x to the d times p inverse. I guess if you really wanted to, you could use the definition of the derivative to show that that derivative operator like commutes through the multiplication by a constant matrix. Okay, but then we can use our power rule on this and that's gonna leave us with p and then we'll have d x to the d minus the identity times p inverse. But we can simplify this a little bit more. So these two quantities are both matrices, but what we can do is maybe split them apart. So let's split them apart and then put a copy of p inverse p right in the middle. So let's see, what, what will that leave us with? So let's maybe bring the whole thing over here. Derivative with respect to x of x to the a will be p d p inverse, and then we'll have p x to the d minus i times p inverse. Well, this term right here is pretty clearly just equal to a, and then using a kind of calculation really similar to what we did right here, we can bring the p and the p inverse into the exponent. That's essentially what happened here. And that'll leave us with x to the p times d minus i times p inverse. But when p and p inverse hit d, they'll turn it into a, and when they hit i, well, they'll just annihilate each other. So that's gonna leave us with an a from here and then an x to the a minus the identity from this other term. And so there we have it. We have another power rule in the case where a is, well, maybe not diagonal, but diagonalizable and it holds the same like pattern that we had before. So that's pretty cool. Now we're gonna look at one more example where a is not diagonalizable. So for our last case, like I said before, we're gonna look at the case when uh, a is not diagonalizable. But every two by two matrix that's not diagonalizable is similar to a matrix of this form. So we have lambda one, zero, lambda. So we might as well just consider a matrix of that form. Okay, so let's start like we did before by looking at what x to the a is. Okay, so x to the a in this case, well, it's gonna be the same thing that we had before, e to the natural log of x times a. Okay. But then that'll be, again, this sum as n goes from zero to infinity, we have one over n factorial, and then we'll have this matrix that looks like lambda natural log of x, and then natural log of x, and then zero, and then lambda natural log of x all raised to the n power. So in fact, we kinda need to get a handle on the nth power of that matrix. And we could prove a general form by using induction, but again, we're just gonna do like a simple example and then the general form follows fairly similarly. So let's look at this. Lambda natural log of x and then natural log of x, zero lambda natural log of x times itself. So let's just write two copies here 
just to make it easy to multiply. So using the strategy for matrix multiplication, we take this first row and swing it into this first column. That'll leave us with a lambda squared natural log of x all squared in this upper entry. And then for this next entry, notice the lambdas don't square, but the natural logs do. So that'll give us a lambda to the first power and then a natural log of x squared. But we're actually gonna have two copies of it because we get it from both overlaps. And then down in this bottom right entry, we have the same thing that we had before. So lambda squared, natural log of x squared. So something like that. So now from here, let's notice that for each of these, we'll be able to factor out a power of natural log. Here we had a square on the matrix, we had a natural log of x squared. So it stands to reason that we can factor out a natural log of x to the n. So that's gonna leave us with, well, we'll have this sum, n is going from zero to infinity, natural log of x to the n over n factorial. So here on the diagonal, we have a lambda squared from a squaring the matrix. So it stands to reason that on the diagonal, we should have a lambda to the n. So let's put those in. And then maybe after doing a couple more examples to get an idea of what the pattern is. Here we'll have an n times lambda to the n minus one. So let's write that down. Okay, great. But now let's bring that sum in. But actually while we're at it, on the diagonal, we're not gonna get anything new than we had from the previous example. So I'm gonna go ahead and write this as x to the lambda. We have a zero here and an x to the lambda here. And then for this upper right entry, notice this n will cancel this n factorial down to an n minus one factorial in the cases when n is not zero. When n is zero, it's just gonna cancel it out. So we might as well start this new sum at n equals one. And then we'll have a natural log of x to the n and then a lambda to the n minus one over n minus one factorial after that simplification occurred. But note that we can take a natural log of x out of this, and that means this exponent right here will match the other exponents, leaving us with a sum that looks like the previous sums. It will sum up to x to the lambda, giving us a final form for this matrix with x to the lambda on the diagonals and then x to the lambda times the natural log of x on the off diagonals. Okay, so now let's take that and use it to find the derivative. Okay, so this is what we calculated for our non-diagonalizable case. Now we're ready to take the derivative of this. And we could write it out with the definition of the derivative, but if you notice, all of that maintains things happening on the components. So we might as well just take the derivative of the components here. So that'll leave us with lambda times x to the lambda minus one here. We'll have a zero here, another lambda times x to the lambda minus one here, and then here we need to use the product rule. So we'll have lambda times x to the lambda one minus one times the natural log of x, and then plus x to the lambda minus one. Again, using the product rule. Now let's take this and write it as the sum of two matrices. So I'm gonna write it as well, a lambda x to the lambda minus one, and then x to the lambda minus one, zero, lambda x to the lambda minus one, and then this leftover bit, which is kind of weird, it's lambda x to the lambda minus one times the natural log of x, great. And then let's see if we can write this kind of a nicer way. And in fact, I think we can. Let's maybe factor an x to the lambda minus one out of this. That'll leave us with lambda one, zero lambda, x to the lambda minus one. And then, well, we're gonna bring this weird matrix down. So zero lambda x to the lambda minus one, natural log of x, zero, zero. But then this matrix we have right here is our original matrix A. So in the end, we can write this in terms of our original matrix. We have A, and then we have x to the lambda minus one, plus this weird matrix involving the logarithm. Great, and I think that may be as good as we can do for tying this back with the original matrix A. So we've got an A there, x to the eigenvalue of A minus one, and then this weird thing. So there we have it. Maybe we didn't classify like larger matrices, but I think this is a good enough path for you to play around with it if you want to. 
maybe as a follow-up question, is there a like nicer way of writing this final answer of this derivative of x to a matrix when x is not diagonalizable? I have a feeling that there might be, but I just didn't really find one. And that's a good place to stop.